I need to start this morning with an apology, um, or maybe it's a relief for you, but um, I, the title of the, or in the outline for this session which was circulated, I said we we're going to look at succession planning in scripture and in mission practice, and I'd promised to do something on the, uh, some insights from our early brethren work. Um, I've probably spent more time working on that part of this paper than on the other parts which you're now going to hear, but I've decided that it's inappropriate to try to tack it on at the end. Um, I'm not really ready to do it with any maturity, and um, it deserves maturity before addressing it. So I'm sorry, but I'm going to cut out the um, early brethren reflection on the part and we'll stick with the biblical side of things. I apologise for that, but I think you, uh, it might, it's better that I do that at the moment. Um, a few passages of scripture that I'd just like to, to read. I'm doing some selecting of some passages that were hopefully why I'm selecting them will become clear as the message goes ahead, although I doubt that it will be very clear what the connection is as we read them. So Acts chapter 4 to start with. Acts chapter 4 and verse 32. The little paragraph at the end of Acts chapter 4 that we all know very well. <coughs> Luke is writing and he's referring to the life of the early church in the very early days in Jerusalem and he says, All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned, and brought the money, and put it at the apostles' feet. If you turn over, please, to... Acts chapter 13 and verse 36, just the one verse. It says, Now, when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he died. He fell asleep. He was buried with his ancestors and his body decayed. Second Timothy. Second Timothy, and just some selections from chapter 1. Verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, in keeping with the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. Grace, mercy and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve as my ancestors did with a clear conscience, as, as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers, recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his, uh, his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Saviour, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And of this gospel I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. That's why I'm suffering as I am. Yet this is, in no, this is no cause for shame, because I know whom I have believed, and I'm convinced that he is able to guard what I've entrusted to him until that day. What you heard from me, keep as the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. 
guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in you. Chapter 2, verse 1. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable people who will also be able which will, who will also be qualified to teach others. Heavenly Father, we pray that your word might come alive in fresh ways, and I pray that the thoughts of our hearts and the meditations of our minds and the words of my mouth may all be acceptable in your sight for the glory of your Son, our Saviour. Amen. <clears throat> Training for transition, contextualisation and tra transitioning to a new generation of local leadership. I'm sorry, but the last part of that I am not going to do, as I've just said. The mission practice part won't be there. Um, in a sense, I've got myself to blame that I'm actually doing this message because in some discussions that went on with the committee, I actually suggested this might be a with, might be an issue that we're actually grappling with um, around the world. Certainly it's an issue in our assemblies in New Zealand. It's an issue in Papua New Guinea. How do you make sure that there's a good and a healthy transition from the present generation of leaders to the next generation of leaders? And um, I assume from the fact that the committee responded the way they did that, yes, others think also that it might be a common problem to all of us. So that made me think. I wonder whether a comment that one of our great Christian brethren leaders of the previous, the last generation, made in, 19, in the 1960s. I'm unsure whether it was 63 or 64. I was there, but I don't remember the details of that. So I'm actually going to now do what I'm then going to go on and in the paper say you don't need to do. Um, I'm going to refer to G.C.D. Howley. I wonder how many folk here actually have heard or know who he was. All right, he's not unknown. G.C.D. Howley, at the time he came to visit New Zealand, was the editor of The Witness, which was one of our leading brethren magazines at the time. And he was one of the most insightful editors and writers and speakers that I've heard for, you know, you'd say that after a very long time, he still is. In the course of a message that he gave in Christchurch, New Zealand in the early 1960s, um, and I was just comparatively fresh into the Brethren Assemblies at the time, he said this. He read that verse that I just read to you in Acts chapter 13 and verse 36. Let me read it to you again so you know what we're talking about. Now, when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep, he died. He was buried with his ancestors and his body decayed. Howley said, We all know that when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he died. He was buried with his ancestors and his body decayed. Our problem in the Brethren movement is that when our leaders die, we don't bury them. <laughs> Howley's point was, that too often we brethren have assumed the ideas and influence of an earlier generation should still control and regulate the church life of the present generation instead of welcoming the fresh vision and leadership of the new generation. And the question is, was Howley's comment still applicable or is Howley's comment still applicable? Do we still have the tendency to let the ghosts of those who went before us regulate and control us? At the very point where we're very worried about the way in which some people have too much respect for their ancestors and let ancestor respect dominate present day church life, are we guilty of the same thing in the Brethren movement? Hmm, interesting. All right, what I want to do is I want to survey one sequence of what we could call succession planning in the New Testament, or if you like, leadership transition in the New Testament. And I want us to look particularly at Barnabas and the transition to Paul and the transition from Paul to Timothy. So one continuous succession of three generations that we have for us, before us in the New Testament. And I want to trace that through and ask what principles, what ideas, what insights can we gain by following it. I'm now going to do a little bit of a um, biographical study.
um, since we've been doing mainly exegetical stuff, so that sometimes I can do something different. Um, and I want us to, first of all, meet the man, Barnabas. We know a few things about him from basically three texts, and let's just put together the information. Um, we know something about his family background. Uh, he was named Joseph, that was his proper name, but he had been nicknamed Barnabas, or son of encouragement. His national and tribal links um, as, uh, told us there he was born and raised in Cyprus, so he was a Jew of the diaspora with a, Lev <coughs> a Levite's family heritage, a family heritage, a family line heritage of commitment to doing God's service and knowing that you had a responsibility <coughs> to serve God on behalf of your whole nation. That's a pretty good heritage to have. <coughs> he was resident um, in Jerusalem, probably because he had to do his turn in the Levitical system. You know what happened, you know, month by month they rotated and took turns in it. He was an expatriate, we would describe, um, who maintained links with his home area. Um, his status, we put there, he was brought up as a migrant, a diaspora Cypriot Jew. He was a landover, landowner, he was comparatively well off. And we know a little bit about some of the rest of his family. He had a cousin, or might have been a nephew, um, John Mark, if, if Bruce weighs the options and comes down on the side of cousin. Um, he had an aunt, uh, that's spelled A-U-N-T, pronounced aunt. Uh, sorry, aunt, is what we would say. Um, and he, she may have been a sister, but it's more likely an aunt. Uh, Mary was the owner of the house in which the uh, early church met when Peter was in prison and he came to them and they were too busy praying to, that he would be released to let him actually come in and see them. That was in Barnabas's auntie's home, uh, possibly the site of the upper room uh, meetings of Jesus. And <clears throat> there are two important things, though, that I just want to highlight. There are two things about uh, Barnabas that we know right, were true right at the very beginning, or that uh, are the reasons why he's mentioned at the beginning. And they're recorded in that little passage in Acts chapter 4. First of all, he was part of this this movement within the early church, which Luke sums up as saying, there was great grace upon them all. The amazing reality of God's free gift of salvation in Christ that's received simply by offering, by receiving and, and responding in faith. Barnabas had taken hold of this and it had deeply affected his life. He was a real Christian. He was seriously committed to Christ as our early brethren, or Anthony Norris Groves would have called it, he understood Christian devotedness, particularly because, excuse me, as, um, as it says in the end of that passage in Acts 4, he had sold one of his properties and bought the contribution or the income from that and gave it to the apostles to distribute for the sake of the church. And this was clearly an evidence that the grace of Christ that had brought him to Christ has transformed his lifestyle so that commitment and devotion were the fundamental starting point uh, that he came from. Had I gone on to discuss the Brethren missionary contribution, that would have been the point I would have made first. Anthony Norris Grove's whole ministry was based on the fact that it's the love of God demonstrated publicly by the way you devote your possessions to serve him that brings people to Christ. The whole history of the church demonstrates this according to Anthony Norris Groves. So our devotion in the sense of giving not only ourselves but our possessions freely to Christ is the foundation of Barnabas's ministry and Groves would say real missionary work as well. Um, Barnabas would probably agree with him. Okay, so this is the person we're talking about. A person who has completely devoted himself to God in the sense of being willing to give up what he had and he was trusting God therefore. He lived with an act of faith in the present reality of God with him. Christ had first place in his life. We'll come back to some aspects of that in a moment. But I want to just run down the foundations which I think Barnabas uh, was laying early on in his ministry for the transition to another generation of leadership. The first thing we see about Barnabas is that he had faith in God's power to change people. He had faith in God's power to change people. 
Therefore, he opens doors for people to come into the church. Now, you know the story in Acts chapter 9, and the situation the church within was in. They were struggling under the awful persecution of Saul the persecutor. He was wreaking havoc, is the way um, the Acts account later puts it, um, amongst the believers. And they were in, under hard pressure, and the ordinary believers were being scattered all around the world. And news came to the church in Jerusalem that this chief persecutor's got authority from the high priest, the chief priest, in fact, to go to Damascus and to um, bring back any, Christian, any Jewish Christian converts and to put them into prison, whether women or men. And so this guy is the number one enemy of the church. But after a time when he's heard nothing about um, the Saul, Saul the persecutor turns up again in Jerusalem, and here he is knocking on the door of the church saying, um, I want to come and join you. And it says quite clearly in Acts chapter 9, verse 26, 25, I think it is, it says, what I'm going to say, it says, the apostles didn't believe him. You know what it's like? You used to run the Bible class. And there was just that one guy who was nothing but a pain in the neck. Every time you tried to get serious with him, he'd make some silly fun and try and take everybody's attention away and spoil the whole Bible class. And the more you tried to relate to him, the more rebellious he seemed to be. And he just disrupted anything. Then he goes away to university. And four years later, he comes back. He says, oh, I've met the Lord and everything's sorted out. Can I, can I lead the Bible class? <laughs> Don't be silly, boy. We're not that gullible. We all know what it's like that we don't take notice of these people who claim to be changed. First two words in our English Bibles on Acts chapter 9 verse 26 are vital. See what it says? It says, but Barnabas. But Barnabas. The apostles didn't believe that this persecutor could possibly have changed, but Barnabas. And it tells us that Barnabas did one thing, obviously, it doesn't say he did it, but he must have, because he opened the door into the church for Saul by going to the, to the apostles and explaining how he has, in fact, been transformed through conversion and he's already preaching the gospel and doing it very effectively. Barnabas had done what to make that possible? Hmm? The others, he checked him out. Okay, so what do you have to do to check a person out? And usually what? In that sitting down with them, what do you have to do? Listen. Listen. Right. A most uncommon Christian ministry skill. But Barnabas knew how to listen because he believed God works in other people's lives. And he wanted to hear what had happened. Well, he therefore opened the door into, um, into the church for Saul. The second thing, time we see Barnabas in the scriptures, we find that he has faith in another way. He has faith that the Lord, in his grace, crosses cultural barriers and does new things. He believed the Spirit of God isn't bound by what's been done in the past. He can actually do radically new things. And we see it when the gospel comes to Antioch in, in Syria. Um, you know the story. Some unnamed disciples from Cyprus and Cyrene, North Africa and the island of Cyprus. So the Africans and expatriate migrant Jews from Cyprus, so they're possibly related to Barnabas, they had gone to Antioch in Syria and instead of talking about Jesus the Christ as they did with the Jews, they changed their message and started talking and saying that Jesus is kurios, Jesus is Lord. And that was radically new and very, very dangerous because almost everybody in Antioch had a kurios of their own and to add Jesus to the list and suggest here's another kurios that you've got to listen to was the most easy way to introduce syncretism into the gospel message. Really foolish thing to do. Hmm. But it, that's the way you see new things happen. 
Uh, you can work that out later. Uh, and you know what happened? God's grace was with them and great number turned to the Lord, according to Acts chapter 11 and verses 19, 20, 21. And then, of course, the news of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem. I'm not allowed to say what I used to say on that verse because you're not allowed to give, make sexist comments, comments these days. We have to be politically correct. But um, I'm not sure who the ears of the church were, but I used to know very clearly. You can work that out too. <laughs> it's the women in our assembly who know things long before the others do when it comes to this sort of news about what's going on. But somehow the news of what was happening in Antioch comes to the elders and they decide they need, they need to check it out because the idea of new Gentile people coming to Christ um, it causes all sorts of worries about whether they've been properly converted. And who do they send? They send Barnabas because he's the one who they know will be the kind of encourager who can handle this kind of new situation. And he very quickly... Uh, grows in that situation. Um, he comes to Antioch and he, in fact, establishes the church there because it says, when he saw the grace of the Lord, he rejoiced and he taught and strengthened them. He built them up. And that led to even more coming into the church. And so we see him first at this point as somebody who has is not surprised by the new things. He can accept that. He expects the Spirit of God to do new things. He finds it something which makes him thoroughly happy and he's very much part of the establishing of this new cross-cultural ministry of the first, kind, first of its kind in Antioch and Syria in Acts chapter 11. But because he gives priority to equipping new leaders, and he's always worried about where are things going in the leadership of a church, what does he do? He's got the most wonderful opportunity. Here's the first church of Antioch and he's the only one who really understands and can be the best teacher of them all. And so what happens? He goes off and he goes to Tarsus and he, the scriptures imply he literally has to dig up somebody who he has perhaps been praying for for 11 years because it is now 11 years after Paul had to leave Jerusalem in a hurry because of the persecution he'd stood up against himself and he's been, from the, the meaning of the text used in Acts 11, apparently buried in, in Tarsus in his hometown. I wonder what Barnabas has been doing for 11 years, that when he sees the need for a new worker to help him in Antioch, he thinks of the re radical rebel who had brought into the church 11 years before in Jerusalem. What's he been doing for 11 years? He doesn't say it, but I think he must have been praying for him and continuing to think about him. How many young, radical, but potential leaders are you praying for who you haven't seen for 11 years? Hmm? This is where transition begins. This is where making sure the future is properly cared for starts. Okay, he goes to Tarsus. He finds uh, Paul, still Saul by, by name, and he brings him back with him to Antioch. And it tells us that they taught as the guests of the church for a full 12 months. 12 months of systematic, regular, ongoing teaching from Paul and Barnabas. I would have loved to have been there, wouldn't you? That's what we always do when we've got a young church needing to grow. We get the two best available Bible teachers and we give them the opportunity to regularly, systematically, continuously um, use their gift and everybody else welcomes it properly. That's the pattern we brethren who are New Testament believers always follow in establishing a new church. Yes, so do I. Um, all right. It leads, of course, to the need for more leaders, and it apparently Barnabas, with Paul, no doubt, or with Saul, no doubt, is seeking, finding, and bringing into ministry um, not just the one nearly forgotten Saul, but he does the same because we find that at the end of this year's ministry, what's happened? It started with only Barnabas, then he brought Paul, when you look at Acts chapter 13, verse 1, what do you find? Five leaders in the church in, in, um, in Acts 13, verse 1. He's multiplied the leadership through regular systematic Bible teaching. There is no other way, although he continued to insist on trying to find them. All right, Barnabas gives priority to new leaders in his whole ministry. Do you get the pattern? 
He's constantly thinking about leadership. So what does it mean? You go find them, you work with them, you open opportunities for them, you make sure they are beginning to utilize their, their, their gifts. But then um, he recognizes and he obeys God's call to a new work. In the, I would have loved to have been in the elders' meetings in Antioch when the Spirit of God says, set apart Paul and Barnabas, I want them to go and do a new work for me. Here are the two who've built the whole church up and have been giving all the leadership, and God says, right, they're the ones I want to send away. That's what happens in your assembly, is it? The best teachers, the best leaders, the ones who are really taking full responsibility, they're the ones you always give for mission service. Yes? Or do we choose the one who it won't matter? Nobody will notice if they go. Um, no, no, we need them here at home. Yes, we, we're New Testament churches, so we always follow the right pattern. Um, okay, Paul and Barnabas set off on their um, new church, sent out by the Spirit of God, sent out by the church. The two are put side by side in Acts 13, 3 and 4. And Paul and Barnabas go on their mission trip, the first uh, organized missions, a mission trip of its kind recorded in the scripture. They, as they're doing this fresh work, they go, of course, to... Um, or just the point that the slide is making, Barnabas had to let go of his present fruitful, influential position and obey to go in a new way. He didn't hold on to his uh, status or position. They go first to his homeland and Barnabas enlists his cousin um, or nephew, John Mark, to go with them and to join in partnership in the team with Saul. So they set off and began, Barnabas, very soon after they have started on this new missionary journey, begins transitioning to a new leader and he therefore himself has to develop the new skills necessary to support the change that comes if you start doing this. Barnabas recognises very early, apparently, in the uh, missionary journey that Paul, in fact, has gifts that are exceeding his. And at the beginning of Acts chapter 13, you find that it says Barnabas and Paul, or Barnabas and his helpers, went on the trip. By the end of chapter 13, it's talking about Saul and Barnabas, or Saul and his team, and then Paul and his team. The names are reversed because it appears there's been a leadership transition has gone on where Barnabas is handed over to Paul. Now, of course, if you have been in leadership and you hand over leadership to somebody else, what do your relatives all think about it? Down. What does John Mark do about it? John Mark isn't very happy at all that his uncle is no longer the real leadership in the real leadership, so John Mark says, I've had enough, I'm going home. Now, no doubt there are other reasons as well, but I think that may well have been one of them. Um, that's pure speculation. You can have better reasons if, if you want. Um, but the fact is that Barnabas has handed over the leadership responsibilities and it does have implications in the team and seldom do transitions happen easily or without reactions or some people feeling that they don't want to continue to share in it. That's the name of the game. That's part of it. If we try to make transitions and nobody gets upset, it'll never happen. Um, you have to be ready for this. But Barnabas doesn't quit and go back with John Mark. He now gladly continues and takes the support position and he has to learn to do it well. But because he's trusting people and encouraging people, that's what he does. And in Acts 14 it tells us that at the end of their evangelistic trip they go back and they continue to support and hand over leadership to new elders in each of the churches they had established. Keeping, an encourage, keeping on encouraging and trusting people in leadership is part of Barnabas' whole way of approaching things. But it isn't easy. And so we referred in our last session to one of the times when Barnabas has to grapple with being humble enough to accept correction from his previous understudy. And in that argument that took place back in the church at Antioch when the folk had come down from Jerusalem, I wonder how you would have felt, how would I have I reacted when 
the youngster who I've opened the door into the church for, who I've opened the way into ministry for, who I've handed over and given him the charge to lead, now turns around and says, you're not walking straight, Barnabas. It's time you humbled yourself and got in line again. Do we gladly accept that kind of rebuke from our younger um, previous students? It's really hard to hand over, but we need that kind of attitude. We need to be willing to receive rebuke from others and to accept it if it's right, not reject it because of who it's coming from. And it makes Barnabas a better person because despite the fact that he'd faulted, um, he clearly works it through and he becomes a better encourager, demonstrating that failure is not final in Christ. I've hinted at the fact that they were struggling with dealing with the boomerang lessons. You can work that out as we, uh, for yourself as well. Okay, Barnabas, when we next see him, wants to reapply his transitioning priority by starting again, but starting again has problems. Remember in Acts chapter 15, after the Jerusalem conference, um, <clears throat> Paul and Barnabas say to each other, right, time we went on another evangelistic outreach, um, how, who are we going to take with us? And Barnabas says, well, it's quite obvious who we need to take with us. I'm going to take um, Mark. And you remember the, it says they had a paroxysm, is what the Greek says. That things really flared up over this. Now, what was the issue? What were they arguing? What, what was Paul not happy about with John Mark that Barnabas thought wasn't that important? There was something else that was more important. What did Paul say was the reason why he didn't want John Mark and his new team? He did not continue in the work, it says. You see, Paul's a, a, a servant of God. Paul knows that there's nothing more important than the work. The work must always come first. Right? And if somebody doesn't measure up to your expectations in the work, finish. The great Paul might not have said it quite that way, but appears to have adopted that basic approach. Whereas Barnabas says, now that's funny, Paul. I seem to remember a fellow who everybody else had written off. He thought was no good and was rubbish. And I seem to remember that that guy actually once changed and he's actually become quite useful. I think it might be time when we try to do it again, don't you? You see the irony in what's going on? Because for Barnabas, there is something more important than the work, and that's the people. It's the people. It's the equipping and training and building up of people, even people who have once failed. Right? So, Barnabas says, no, no, I want to make sure that we give Mark another chance. So it goes to the church, and it tells us that the church agreed with Paul. Yeah. Church elders, be careful what issues you take sides on, because sometimes it's easy to take sides on the wrong side of the, an argument. And so, sadly, at this point, Barnabas drops out of the picture, and we hear no more of him directly in the scriptures. The church backed Paul and rejected his long-term or rejected Barnabas's long-term transition plans, and Barnabas was dropped from the team and from the work, or so it would seem from the record of Acts. Was that the end? No. Okay, the Barnabas story doesn't end there. Thank God. Barnabas fades from the picture, but his principles bear fruit. And you know the story, we could look at the way in which even Paul himself says in Colossians 4, um, and in two, or when you put together Colossians 4 and 2 Timothy 4, we can say these things. John Mark, Paul says, has become useful. It's a pretty interesting way for Paul to describe the fellow who in the meantime has written a whole gospel. Um, and he now says, okay, he's, he's, he's useful to us. And he's depending on him to explain the, the details of the, the life of Jesus. Yes, John Mark wrote the gospel. Why? 
How do most people respond when they are being considered as a candidate for a mission team and the, the leading evangelist, the greatest of the missionaries, says, no way, he's not fit, I don't want him. And the church agrees with him and says, no, sorry, he's not good enough. We don't want him in the team. How does the young person feel and what does he do? Do they, do they normally say, okay, no worries, I'll just keep going on in any case? No, unless what happens? Unless somebody comes alongside and helps them. And that's exactly what Barnabas did. He clearly helped Mark work through this awful, awful rejection, which they were both were going through together in a sense. And had he not, think how different our Bibles would look. We have the record of the great evangelist and the great missionary, what he did, but we're not told of what it cost Barnabas to actually help reinstate Mark so that he did do his part of the job. And it's worth pondering that and it's worth thinking through which kinds of ministry are most important. Sorry, I get a bit stewed up because I think these things are very important. Um, the son of encouragement, though rejected by the church, continues to encourage those who need his help. But equally important, perhaps more important, I'm not sure, Paul, at this point, <clears throat> we're not told he apologises or that they resolve their argument or anything, but the very first thing Paul does after that big argument was what? In Acts 16 and verse 3, what does he do? It tells us he started doing what Barnabas had been doing all the way through. He recruits Timothy and he gets a younger man, brings him into his team and starts doing for Timothy what who had done for him? What Barnabas had done. He doesn't agree with him, but he adopts his policies. What is that um, saying that we have uh, in English? What is it about um, imitation is the, is the greatest... I've got it written here, yes, the sincerest form of flattery. Imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. Um, Barnabas did what Paul, or Paul did what Barnabas did, although he may not have got round to apologising. And sometimes that's the best you can expect from a great Christian leader. They may never say sorry, but if they take your policies and do what you were telling them to do in any case, well, that's okay. Let, let them do it. It's great seeing that happen, um, but not everybody feels that way. Okay, so what do we say about Barnabas? Was that the, it's the end of his story as far as the scriptures are concerned? Well, Paul uses Barnabas' example to teach self-denial and, and the surrendering of your rights in 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 6. So that maybe suggests that the argument had been resolved, but certainly Paul later uses Barnabas in his teachings. And then to sum it all up in Acts 11 and verse 24, it says of Barnabas, he was a good man, full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Good. He trusted and encouraged people. He was good with people and to people. He was full of faith. Now the only evidence of faith we have in Barnabas is one that he believed God would help him even though he sold his possessions. That's real faith. But all the rest of his examples are faith is faith in people, that God can change people. Do we have that? Do we really believe that God can take and change, develop, improve, transform people? Because this is what the kind of faith that Barnabas was full of. And both of those, being good and being full of that kind of faith, only flow from allowing the Holy Spirit to fill our lives so that we can be full of the Holy Spirit as well. Barnabas, I want to suggest, is an amazing person because... He ensured the transition from the first generation believers in the church. He was the link per de person between the 12 disciples, the original apostles, and the apostle Paul. Without Barnabas, that continuity would have been broken. And that's his, at least the beginnings of an analysis of his importance. All right, I've taken up too much time, but let's move. Um, He's given to us, if you like, the first model for transition and succession planning. And it was built into the way Barnabas clearly felt. 
It begins with the devotion yourself and your wholehearted commitment. It's shown in the way in which you go and seek people. You find them. You bring open doors for them into, into the church, into fellowship, and then open doors into service. And then when they come into leadership, you work under them. And then when they rebuke you, you accept it, and you still keep working with them. This is what transition planning is all about. It's the quality of a person who's prepared to follow through on those principles even when the church disagrees and maybe even when you lose your position because of trying to stand up for the very policy. And some of us have had that experience and many in the history of the church have had it often. All right, let's then have a look. If Barnabas was successful, then the best way to judge it is to have a look at what his first Mentor, mentoree did what his first understudy ended up doing. So we want to have a look and if Paul was successful then he was successful because of what Barnabas had done for him. Let's have a look at the way in which Paul addresses um, transition issues as he tells Timothy, his first understudy, as to how he needs to plan for the next generations. So I want us to do a quick study of First of Second Timothy chapters 1 and the first three verses of chapter 2. But let's go through this, drawing out some highlights. First of all, in Paul's introduction to the letter, as we read, he introduces himself as an apostle by the will of God and a servant of Jesus Christ who brings the promise of life. Now, those two ideas, the purpose of God and a promise of ongoing life, both have with them a particular concept and understanding of time and the importance of time. And this first chapter of 2 Timothy has an amazing range of references to the way time moves meaningfully along. Time is not something with a lot of odd moments that you grab and grasp, and if you don't make the most of them, they're lost. In chapter 1, we find that there's a reference in verse 8, verse 9, to before time began, and then it talks about doing things which will be kept safe in Christ's hands until that day, which is which day? The day of the return of Christ. So in this first chapter, there's an understanding of time as something which began before time began and goes through meaningfully according to a purpose of God right through to the time of Christ's return. There's this big sweep of being set in the middle of an ongoing program because of the purpose of God and the eschatological meaning of salvation because there's a direction in which things are going. Um, one of our friends in, in Auckland, a oh, good Scott actually, um, he talks about this as being the, um, if I can find the word there, maybe not, um, uh, chirological schema, the chirological schema of the scriptures. That there's this awareness that time's got meaning and that it's a kairos, there's a, a timing of God working through things all the way through. Now I'm going to show you how I think Paul builds it up um, in, his, in his teaching. It's the backdrop to the first chapter of 2 Timothy is the awareness of the significance of time. And if we're going to be involved in succession planning, we've got to grasp something of that same awareness. We've got to know that we're here not just for ourselves or not just for our own generation in one sense because we, our generation is part of the much bigger purpose and plan of God that goes on from before eternity until that day, until the return of Christ. And that's the sort of backdrop to the, the whole chapter. Well, leadership transition is driven by gratitude for previous generational successions of service and of faith. Notice in verse 3 there, um, Paul says, I thank God whom I serve as my ancestors did with a clear conscience. Paul was very conscious apparently of the way in which his Jewish religious heritage has brought him to this place now. He can thank God for what his ancestors had done. Now his ancestors had not been Christians, but he can thank God for what they had done and give an example of Steady service. It's the Greek word liturgos, which is mean, which is given. So he may be referring to benevolent good deeds, or he may be referring to actual temple service that his ancestors had been involved in. But Paul appreciates his pre-Christian past 
as he focuses on the future. Do you do that? Do I do that? I get really worried at the number of people who were brought up in our assemblies and who get caught into other places and they want to quite totally cut off and ignore and deny all that they got and all that they depend on from that earlier time before their new revelation and their new opportunities of service. Paul thanks God for what his ancestors contributed to him because he's concerned of making good, trend, good future transitions. Do you get the point I'm making? No appreciation of how we became who we are, even before we'd come to Christ, is poor preparation for wanting to keep going in the, into the future. So for Paul, on behalf of the older generation, he expresses his gratitude for the succession of conscientious temple service or exemplary benevolence, which had extended from his Hebrew ancestors down to Paul himself. He has an ongoing appreciation for the value of his pre-conversion religious experience or heritage, the same as we were trying to hint in the earlier session from Galatians 3. Um, but Paul did not live in the past. He makes those comments and then he immediately goes in to refer to his constantly remembering you in my prayers. You don't live in the past. You're grateful for it, but you pray for the younger folk and their future. You get the point? He's grateful for his own past so that he can pray more effectively for the younger generation who are going to go on into the future. And I wish I could get that sort of sense of the bigness of the time factor in our place within God's purposes. Paul is, lives in that awareness all the time. So he gives thanks for the previous background from where he's come from, but he prays for the younger generation coming on. For Timothy's part, he tells him that um, he thanks God for the succession of hypocrisy-free faith, is what he says literally, the faith that was in his, his grandmother, in his mother, and now Paul says it's living, it's alive and new. That is what he says. It's, he gives thanks not just for their faith, but for their hypocrisy-free, their sincere faith. That's worth thinking about. In the process of transition from one generation to the next, there's nothing more important about each generation's faith than that it is sincere without hypocrisy. There's nothing turns off our kids from our faith more than seeing mum and dad living hypocritically. True? Our teenagers very quickly pick up on the inconsistencies between our walk and our talk, and it turns more of our children away than anything else. Equally clearly, if the children's faith is not without hypocrisy, if it's not sincere, if they don't come to a living relationship with Christ, if they're just doing it because mum said they've got to go to church, if theirs is just insincere, then they're not going to have any part in the ongoing plan and purpose of God. Sincerity in faith, a lack of hypocrisy, being having integrity, being true to what we actually teach by the way we live is the fundamental clue to making sure that our kids follow in the pathway we are on. And Paul tells Timothy, you should thank God that you've got grandparents and parents who were living with that kind of sincerity. All right, we can go on. The next section suggests that leadership transition depends on keeping faith alive in the current generation because before Paul says anything about the future to Timothy, he says a lot about Timothy's present situation. On Paul's part, he ensures that faith is vital in the present generation by the use of memory, recall, and reminders in verses 3 to 5. And we've just been through some of the things he said. He reminds Timothy, he remembers his tears, he's, got the, he's recalling what God did amongst them. And the older generation, not just for the sake of reminiscing, but for the sake of continuity, need to use their memory in the service of Christ. And we've had that brought before us a couple of times already in this time. But he calls Timothy to do his part to ensure vitality of the faith in his own generation by rekindling his gift, by addressing his personal weaknesses. The faith won't continue if we let our timidity overcome uh, or dominate so that we continue to be ashamed and we don't get involved in witnessing. And he's saying this pretty clearly to Timothy in this first chapter. He says, 
God's Spirit does not call you to continue in timidity. He offers you power, he offers you love, and he offers you a whole sound mind. So Frosinay, that beautiful disciplined thinking that will get you beyond your timidity. So he's challenging Timothy to grapple with his own character weaknesses for the sake of the continuation of the faith. Do we do this with our um, understudies? He wants Timothy to, to stand up and courageously partner with him in the gospel, knowing that it will cost, but getting beyond his, his fears and his timidity. It's a pretty bold thing to do, and yet young people need a challenge. Just put in the note there, notice that in verse 6, in verse 7, and in verse 8, there is specific reference to the work of the Holy Spirit in this. It's only the Holy Spirit who can keep the faith alive in any generation. And Paul's stressing this. On one occasion he talks about the power of God, but it's certainly the power of God through the Spirit that he has in mind there. We need the Spirit, and the Spirit is involved in making sure continuity of faith. All right. Transition planning rests on God's, on God's generation transcending eternal purpose and saving grace. And there's a sort of an interlude here in verses 9 and 10. And there's an amazing thing said. It says it's only by the God whose power will strengthen Timothy who has saved us and he called us to a holy life, not because of anything we've done, but because of his own purpose and grace. And then he says, this grace was given us in Jesus Christ before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Saviour Christ Jesus, who has dest destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Do you see the time span in that verse? Before time began, God planned and he gave his grace for us. We need to bring our thinking about salvation and the plan of salvation into line with this biblical teaching. So the salvation plan was not something dreamed up in Genesis 3 to respond to the devil's trickery. It wasn't some emergency plan that suddenly clicked in because things had gone wrong. The grace of God was planned within the trinity of Father, Son and Spirit before creation took place and time as we know it began. That's amazing. Don't ask me to explain it. I can only proclaim it. But that amazing plan from the beginning, which included each of us, was manifested. It was revealed. It was opened up so we could see it when Christ came. And through the good news of Christ, he destroyed the thing that stopped the progression of time. He destroyed death. And he bought immortality, life that continues, life that goes on beyond death. A whole new understanding of the fact that death's only a doorway, it's not the end. He brought immortality to light, so he changed our understanding of thinking about time. Conversion ought to change our understanding of time. On the notes I've given it to you concisely, but let me explain what I'm saying. In Papua New Guinea, the pidgin English that we use, the common uh, language that we use for communicating across the 800 different vernaculars that we have amongst 5 million people in Papua New Guinea. You get that? We have 800 different languages, not dialects, languages amongst only 5 million people in Papua New Guinea. So our trade languages are pretty important, or we could never communicate. In pidgin, the pidgin word for the time of the ancestors or the things which uh, went on before the present time now, the time which is already past and gone, is described as time before, before, um, which basically means the time which is in front of your face. Because you see, Papua New Guinea has walked through time like this because what happens today is controlled by who? The ancestors. The ancestors control everything that I can do today. And so time that I'm in now is dependent on the time before, the time before my face, which is the time that has passed. The things that are still in the future are described as time behind. So you say, before you may make a one pill or something, before, and the things in time that is gone, we did something. Behind by you may make a not a fellow something. 
in the future we'll do something else. It's behind us because we dare not turn our face away from the ancestors. That's scary and risky and you don't do it. Until you meet the Christ who gave grace from the beginning of time and is leading us through immortality to that day. And Christ's invasion of your life turns you around in regard to time. You've all experienced that? I hope so. Um, because that's what he's talking about here. But an understanding of the biblical concept of chirological schema of kairos, of God's purposes working through, can be quite transforming of life in many ways. This grace purpose has been displayed publicly through the appearance of Christ and it was achieved through the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's an amazing statement, isn't it? That the bringing of light to light of immortality was only possible because of the gospel. How often have you preached on that fact? Hmm? All right, there's that little interview. It's very important, but I think it's important because how we think about time determines whether we'll get worried about transition or not. The wrong attitude to present time means we might be content just to live in it. Well, gathering it together, leadership transition works, says Paul, through transition principles, and there are three of them. There's a commissioning principle, there's an entrusting principle, and there's a long-term planning principle. And I'm sorry we have running out of time, but he also stresses that all of those three Principles are dependent on the Holy Spirit. He says the first transition principle is that present leaders fulfill their commission here and now. Paul says, I was made a herald, an apostle, and a teacher, and I have committed that trust back to Christ, and he will keep me faithful to the end. He knows that he needs the help of Christ because his commission involves considerable cost, and the key to fulfilling the commission there is trusting Christ to keep you. I know in whom I have believed, as the scripture and the songs say. All right, so the first step for future transition is to, for the present leadership to fulfill their mission properly in dependence on, on Christ, depending on the Spirit to help you in the midst of the cost of doing that faithfully. The second transition principle, in a sense the key one, is that Paul can tell us how he then handed on to Timothy a deposit or a trust that Timothy now has to take and to use properly. So the second principle is to entrust and hand on the deposit to the next generation. What that means is that they will need to follow the pattern of healthy teaching they've received and seen in the older generation. And particularly that teaching should be cultivating love and faith. The Christ-like character is what's necessary for continuing transition. And so he reminds Timothy to do what he's been doing. I have committed my trust to Christ and I'm trusting him to keep me. And so he says in verse uh, 13 14 there, um, guard the good deposit <coughs> that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in you. And then he reminds him again in the first two verses or first and third verse of chapter 2, grasp firmly the same grace that is in Christ Jesus, embracing the cost. You need the very grace that I have been holding on to, but you must measure up and realise you're going to have to endure and handle the cost that's involved. So here's the transition around handing on a deposit, giving a lifestyle of, of example to follow and reminding the person the new generation, the younger generation, that they'll need to depend on the Spirit of God, they'll need to trust Christ to keep them as he's been keeping the older generation and watch for the cost and continue in it. And the third principle is the one you all thought I was going to start with. Um, Paul charges Timothy with, a transition, with transition planning for the next two generations. That is chapter 2, verse 2. You all, we all know it, don't we? He says, the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable people who will also be <coughs> qualified to teach others. In that verse, how many generations are up in Paul's mind? All right, let's look at them. The first generation was Paul. And what was his task in that first generation? He taught the original word and he lived it. Second generation was Timothy. And it says, you heard it with witnesses, with other witnesses. They heard Paul's word and 
they, that was entrusted to them and they are the ones who have got the responsibility or they've been told they've got to entrust it to other reliable people. The third generation are those ones Timothy entrusts it to. They've got the capacity to teach others also. That's the one thing they need to receive the trust. And then, so Timothy had received the trust, or the, the, uh, a new generation is going to receive the, trust, the words from Timothy. But they are told to be the kind of people who will hand things on to the fourth generation. So the two future generations, Timothy is being told to think about and to plan for. There's a Chinese proverb that says, if you're planning for a year, plant rice. If you're planning for 10 years, plant trees. If you're planning for a century, plant people. They used to say men, actually, but it's people. And Paul had grasped that very clearly. Paul had a 100-year plan that he hands over to Timothy. What's your 75-year plan looking like? Hmm? Because, you see, Timothy is responsible now not just to hand on the message to the next generation, but to hand on the responsibility for handing on the message to the next generation. Get the point? In trusting the next generation with the work, we've got to trust them with the task of transition. And so this is the way it all multiplies. Okay, sorry I've taken so much time, but let's try to just bring it together. Succession planning involves the following things. It begins with devotedness. We're committing ourselves and our possessions unreservedly to Christ so that we trust him actively, continually in our day. It continues with early recognising and empowering of the gifts of, younger, of the younger generation. It's cultivated by an awareness of the importance of a time perspective which recognises God's purpose at work across the generation. It's fueled by faith, faith in people and in the Holy Spirit at the local church and at the ministry level. I think it's got lost there somewhere. Um, apologies for that. No, oh, there it is down there. Um, yes, the, um, the at local level there. Um, probably belong a bit further up, but that'll be right. Um, it's fostered by what I'm describing here is the Barnabas policy, the, the policy which seeks, finds and grows people of younger generation even when it really leads to misunderstanding and exclusion and rejection for you. And there will be times when just because you want to give somebody else another chance or you really do want to work on developing people, you'll be put aside because you're not giving enough time to the program, to the work. But remember Barnabas. The transition plan implements the transition principles and it gives them priority at the local church level and in every area of ministry. Our support programs need to be thinking about this just as much as the local church does. It demonstrates a willingness to hand over responsibilities and to continue in subordinate supporting roles, even accepting reproof and advice from the previous understudies. And it keeps encouraging the younger generation to start succession planning early. What's your response? Thank you for your attention. I just pray that this might be helpful.